take it away. Hi. Um, oops. Okay. My name is Esther Jang, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington, presenting work being done jointly with the University of the Philippines on improving the long-term sustainability of community cellular networks. How many of you have heard of community cellular networks? Awesome. That's quite a few, um, unexpectedly. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who haven't, community cellular networks, or CCNs, are full-stack cellular networks designed to serve small, rural, and remote communities who are not served by national telecoms. This can be because of low population densities, meaning low return on investment, as well as challenging environmental factors such as frequent natural disasters, unreliable power infrastructure, and difficulty getting engineers and equipment to these remote areas. This is the view from the top of a cell tower deployed in Aurora province in the Philippines by the UP Wireless Communications Engineering Lab, the first of a series of seven deployments to be completed within the next year. These community cellular sites are designed to be simple and low cost at around $10,000, low power and minimal in terms of components, and include a solar power system if there isn't a clean or reliable power source, which is often the case. Another thing that's special about these sites is that the university has structured all of their deployments to be community owned and maintained, for example, by a local fishing cooperative, in this case, or a local government office to promote community autonomy and sustainability. But as I mentioned before, one of the biggest challenges of running these networks is long-term sustainable maintenance and servicing. If anything goes wrong, which happens pretty often in these areas due to landslides and typhoons, communities may wait for days or weeks for an expert to come or will have to perform repairs themselves. The traditional solution is for the experts installing the network to spend a lot of time and effort training specific individuals to perform easier repair tasks. But people leave the community, get different jobs, and that knowledge is often lost with personnel turnover. And ultimately, an expert will have to be on call for any more complicated situations. So our research goal was to ask the question, can we make these networks more reliable by increasing people's capacity to repair their own networks without an expert? What if we could do this by mobilizing knowledge and experience they may already have? For example, living in an area without grid power, some people may already know how to repair solar power systems. So collectively, the community may not need extra training to fix certain problems. But to engage these local people, we would still need a notification when there is a problem indicating what might be wrong and a mechanism for recruiting the right people who know how to fix it. So the solution we proposed to try and do this was a monitoring system that would send out SMS alerts to local people when basic maintenance or repair tasks were needed and encourage local expertise to emerge. We chose SMS to start since basic phones with SMS capability are a common denominator in these areas, though we're now exploring other options. And we would instrument the base station with relevant software or hardware sensors to detect errors, such as a voltage sensor for draining batteries or a temperature sensor for overheating equipment. Eventually, we also hope to use the sensor readings and some appropriately designed SMS instructions to support repair of more complicated issues that people are not used to dealing with. The study in this paper was a preliminary attempt to see whether such a system would be at all reasonable. We wanted to measure whether or not people would come to the site and whether they would be able to solve common problems without an expert present. So I would like to try something with you all so you can get a sense of what the system would be like. Let's do some role playing. You receive the following SMS. The Wi-Fi network at the Palais de Congress is having a technical problem. Please come to registration to help resolve this. How many of you would respond? That's like five to 10. Um, okay, so what would you do first? Um, any volunteers? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. Um, so any, anyone else? Cool, okay. Well, so um, you guys are all clearly very technical people and this is a technical conference, so that makes sense. You would just go straight for the equipment, right? But how many of you would like ignore the message? Um, how many would feel suspicious? What, like, what is this? Who is asking me? Um, and so like, 
would you go help immediately? Would you be giving a talk and like drop your things and run? Or would you go help later? Or would you ask your friends? How many would, you, would ask other people what's going on? Yeah, that's like the majority. Um, so one thing to note is that our responses are highly dependent on you know, the social context. Basically, who owns the equipment? How much responsibility do we feel over it? Um, how much do we think we can personally do? And also, what do other people think um, about what to do? So um, to explore this question in the community cellular context, we wanted to run the following experiment. One week before our chosen study date, we sent SMS messages to all the subscribers on a community's network, informing people to expect help messages from the operator. Hello from the network. We will be deploying a new system soon that asks subscribers to assist in the maintenance of the system. Please be on the lookout for messages and come help if you have time. Note that this message was in Filipino originally, but is translated to English here. On the study date, we sent SMS messages to the 64 subscribers who happened to be on the network between noon and 4 p.m. that day. When a participant arrived at the site, we interviewed them one-on-one -on -one about their experiences with repair and asked them to talk through with us how they would solve three example repair problems drawn from our experiences with community cellular deployments. For completeness, I'll mention that on the study date, we sent out three different versions of the message and randomly selected a third of the recipients to receive each one, though we didn't find a significant difference between them, probably due to low sample size. So the first was, the cell tower is having a problem. Can you come to the Barangay Center, which is like a town hall, and help? Uh, the second message indicated a specific technology, in this case, the solar panels. And the third message was a generic message about the cell tower, but also indicated that others had received the message. And for our field site, we went to a rural barangay, uh, which you can think of as a town, called San Andres on the island of Luzon on the, in the Philippines, about a three hour commute from Manila. And the network there, though it uses the same core technology as our deployments, was set up around two years ago by the National Telecom Globe and is managed very differently from ours. Globe assigned the head of the local government, or the barangay captain, and the tanod, who is analogous to a town sheriff, to manage the network. However, they had not been instructed on how to perform repairs themselves, but only to contact a globe engineer when something goes wrong. The equipment is also kept behind a fence in this large metal box and is generally more complex to use and a little bit over-engineered compared to the equipment that we deploy. However, at this point last year, the University of the Philippines sites were not fully up yet, so we decided to start our investigation here. So who responded to our messages? Uh, the first notable result after we sent out the SMSs was that over a third of the 64 recipients came to participate. One of our 24 respondents was drunk, so we excluded him from the rest of our analysis. <laughs> <laughs> the second was that three quarters of them were women. Everyone knows what three quarters looks like, so I must admit I didn't try very hard with this figure. Anyway, we found out during the interviews that this was due in part to many of the men being away for work in the city during the day or during part of the work week. Uh, we'll also find out in a second who these young people are. There was a wide range of occupations amongst the respondents, of which I'll highlight just a few. In this list, the women are colored in blue and the men in red. We had a banana farmer, three housewives, a recycler and trader, and she recruited and sent her son, who is a recent graduate in agricultural engineering, because she thought that would be helpful. In general, we saw interesting recruitment dynamics where often people would send the most technical person in their immediate family or vicinity, or sometimes talk with neighbors about the SMS message before coming either alone or as a group. Uh, but I don't have time to get into detail, so please check out the paper for more details. Uh, these three were all either students or recent graduates in engineering in the area, who are the young men from before. Uh, there was one woman who makes and sells bamboo brooms who described herself as a fast learner and was clearly very smart and eager to be involved. There was a real estate agent, a lay minister or local legal authority who handles land disputes, and a rice farmer slash self-described handyman. Basically, these were mostly ordinary people from the town, skewed slightly towards having some favorable attitude towards technology, especially the cell network. As the real estate agent said, if we can, we would surely do it referring to helping with the repairs, because it helps the whole community and it's very hard without the cell service. Now I'll get into how well people did on the repair tasks themselves. 
The first task was posed as an SMS alert message saying that the cell site solar panels were not generating enough power. The participants were shown this picture, and the answer we were looking for is that the solar panels needed to be cleaned. They did very well on this problem. All but one participant got the answer right. The percentage of correct responses is shown here on the graph in white. Um, the other two problems are also shown here, but I'll grade them out for now and compare them later. Uh, when asked how they knew what to do, nearly all participants gave a correct explanation of how solar panels worked by receiving energy from the sun and said that any blockages would prevent, e prevent energy from being received. They generally got this right, even if they didn't have a solar set at home, which nearly two-thirds of participants did, as the town doesn't have grid power. However, when we asked whether they would be willing to perform the repair on their own, only 74% were willing. The willing to act group is shown here in green. The others expressed discomfort, saying, we're really not the kind of people who tamper with things if we're not allowed. There's a general impression of the cell site being off limits. One young man even said, there's a sign that said, no ID, no entry on the gate, even though when we checked, there was no such sign. Okay, so what about the second problem? This problem was significantly less familiar to people and revealed some more complex barriers to repair. The problem statement was that the position of the antenna had changed, where this is an omnidirectional broadcast antenna that provides coverage and is normally mounted vertically, but had perhaps been knocked out of place by strong winds during a typhoon. Participants were shown this picture and expected to say that they would straighten the antenna back to the vertical alignment. About half the participants said some variant of this. The correct responses are shown by the white bar. The red part of the bar shows the participants who gave solutions but did not clearly state the correct solution, so we're going to call those incorrect solutions. Again, we see that only three participants, shown in green here, felt willing to act on their own to solve this problem, and nearly all participants preferred someone official to do the repair. This shows a feeling of not being authorized, but with an even lower certainty than in the solar problem of being able to do the right thing without messing up and incurring some kind of liability. We interpreted this as a training need and also noted that many of the people who said the correct solution mentioned experience aligning a home satellite receiver to point in the right direction. One of the ideas that has come out of this is, can we add appropriate visual cues to the equipment so that it looks more familiar and maybe even source local parts for the tower to some extent so people are more certain of what to do? For example, should we add a mark or even a fake reflector dish to make people more likely to point the antenna in the right direction? Okay, so finally, here's the third problem. This problem actually presents an example of a familiarity mismatch, where the problem statement causes people to reference an experience that doesn't really help them get to the solution. The problem statement was that the CPU inside the cell side rack is overheating, and the solution was to increase ventilation to the CPU, either by leaving the metal enclosure open or adding a fan, etc. Only one out of 23 solutions was correct. That was the lay minister who said, if it's overheating, there's an electric fan inside that's not working, even before seeing the picture for the problem, perhaps indicating some prior experience with broken cooling fans. But as you can see by the mostly red bar here, many solutions were proposed which we considered insufficient, the most common one being just to turn it off and let it rest or stop using it for a while. It turns out most people felt very familiar with this problem, referencing either their cell phone overheating while charging, or that a portable TV running off a generator had overheated or even exploded due to electrical and wiring issues. So uh, shown in green and yellow here are the total people, correct and incorrect, who indicated that they would be comfortable performing the repair they proposed on their own, meaning they were more or less certain that it was the right thing to do and would not do harm. However, when we asked them to find the off switch in the picture, they were generally unable to do so and mostly guessed based on the color. This also highlights that sourcing local, local components such as switches could help with familiarity and correct repair behavior. So to conclude, from this preliminary study, we've learned some network design considerations that could help with sustainable rural repair with a low training cost. These include locally sourcing parts, adding visual cues to make components look more familiar or to make it obvious what to do with them. For tasks that need it, making repair instructions that can be related to people's personal experiences. 
and as part of the work of setting up a deployment, having a conversation with the community about making an explicit liability plan to make it clear what people are allowed to do, sort of the opposite, about, uh, opposite of a clause about voiding the warranty for self-fixing. In future, we hope to do a broader comparative study of more communities, including both Globe and University of Philippines sites, to see if community engagement with repair and what people expect to be able and allowed to do differs between the different management styles. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my advisor and the UW ICTD lab and the University of Philippines WCEL lab. Thank you. Hi, I'm Safe Savage from uh, University of West Virginia. Um, great talk. Um, do you think that it's also worth to consider uh, creating design implications uh, where we consider gender as a factor, given that uh, you saw that a, a great portion of the volunteers were women? Um, and another one is, uh, in the long term, uh, do you think that these approaches uh, are viable, or do you feel that volunteers might start to drop off once the novelty uh, is over? And thank you. This is a great topic. Yeah, those are both awesome questions. Um, I definitely would like to uh, use a gender lens while doing this work. Um, I think it's really important that uh, most of the people who responded were women um, because they like happen to be the people who hold down the fort in that town. And um, so it, uh, it would be really nice to like encourage sort of engineering expertise of women in these towns. Um, but I'm not quite sure how to do that yet, so we'll see. Um, the other question was about sustainability. I guess novelty effects um, are, are certainly a thing in this experiment. Um, so we're going to conduct more research um, over the summer to uh, test this at more sites and sort of do more in-depth, uh, like use ethnographic methods to figure out whether people actually want to do this kind of work. Um, so thank you. Hi, uh, Neha Kumar, Georgia Tech. Uh, thanks, Esther. That was an excellent uh, talk. I was really engaged uh, throughout. So uh, my question is, um, when you mentioned the problems, right? There's, uh, so one aspect of the situation might be to identify solutions when you know what the problem is. But then what about the, the challenges of identifying the problems um, to begin with? And, and how challenging do you think that might be? Right. I actually think that's it's quite challenging. That's like, uh, you know, most of the work of debugging. Um, and we were hoping to automate a lot of that by having these sensors. So um, currently, you know, we're trying to figure out oh, what the, the biggest, the most common problems will be um, based on our ongoing experience, which increases with the number of deployments. Mm -hmm. um, so we can try to add more sensors as long as they're easy and like sustainable sensors, uh, maybe that are already on the equipment. But um, and, and then we can, you know, um, use our knowledge to sort of help with that process, the identifying the problem process. But ultimately, we do need like a more general debugging procedure, like check this first, then check that first. Then. So we will have to have those kinds of instructions. And we hope to build those into the system to like uh, make those accessible even when experts are not present. Yeah. Cool. Thank I you. look forward to hearing about that. Thanks. Cool. I'm at University of Toronto. Great work, great presentation. I'm like totally thrilled uh, seeing your work. So I, uh, so I had uh, this question. So when you were uh, talking to these people, how they were engaging with uh, the repair work, did you guys learn something new from the sort of rhetorics that they were using, how to fix those things? I was wondering whether uh, after like learning about all these problems, did you find them to be creative to come up with the kind of you know like a solution or design that you? you think could be uh, interesting or more situated for their context? I mean, uh, one aspect of uh, it I totally understand is how to educate them, how they can like repair and fix like, their stuff. But could we learn uh, something from them that uh, could help us design something more sustainable and situated for their context? Uh, 
Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I think people gave us a lot of suggestions sort of like on the way to um, answering our questions. And so one of them being the, the guy who just said off the bat to the overheating problem, oh, you just need to add a fan. So we're like, oh, okay, well, there is no fan inside the, the big box, but what if we just added a fan? Because it's clearly a thing that's available in the community. Um, and there's also the, the color of the switches and making the switches like look clearly like switches um, and all those things. And I think um, this site was a little hard to work with because it was already like uh, set up by the telecom, but in our site, we can design it. So we would actually like to take a co-design approach and uh, design it so that people will understand and be able to make the labels themselves and things like that. So that would be cool. Thank you. Thank you.